thank you everybody for attending this session, um, the life cycle of a STEM role model. So this is our 10th webinar after doing the series. We started in July. So my name is Frieden Zaba and I work at Rolls-Royce as a manufacturing engineer. Um, and I also founded this Educator Global non-social profit, um, non-profit um, organization. Um, so the whole point of these webinars are taking everybody through a journey of becoming like a STEM role model. So this particular session will be focused on um, leadership. So once you're already in your um, career, your chosen role, and you want to find out how else do I go to the next step to become a leader? Um, once you've had, let's say, five to 10 years experience in the field. So this is why we've got Mary Hominson, um, who's our guest speaker, and she'll be talking to us about the leadership aspects and her experiences. So we've got Michelle. So I'll let Michelle, the co-host, introduce herself as well. Hi guys, uh, my name is Michelle. Um, so a little bit about me. I recently graduated, 2020 graduate um, in chemical engineering from Aston Uni and I'm currently doing my master's. Um, I spent a time, so I did a placement year during uni and I did spend that time um, in Rolls Royce, which is where I met Frida. And um, I've been an Abbott STEM ambassador since set my second year of uni now and now I'm in my master's year. So working with educator for me, um, it's a great way to kind of push the, the STEM agenda, especially with diversity and inclusion. So, um, so now I'm going to pass it on to Mary to introduce herself. Yep. So Mary, could you give us your um, occupation, fun fact about yourself and what have you been up to? Well, thank you both Frida and Michelle and thanks for inviting. It's, it's fun to be here. I hope we have a great dialogue. I'm expecting I'm going to learn a ton as well. So thank you for, for asking me to, uh, to chat with you. So my background is a 30 plus year career to date, mainly in HR. I've also had some experiences cross-functionally. I was in finance for several years earlier in my career and I've had the opportunity later in my career to broaden and, and lead areas like communications, public affairs. And I have had some global responsibility where regional leaders reported into me as well. Um, you can see my background studying psychology early. I did a great study abroad in the UK early on, which really opened my culture aperture, having grown up in a small town and um, being exposed to not just another country, but um, another culture to travel broadly. I went on to grad school and I studied business. So I supplemented my psychology background with a really great background in business. Um, which also has allowed me to pivot a lot in my career and, and explore different things and not just stay on one path. Um, early on, as you probably saw, I, I went into a HR program in, in, at GE, which was a brilliant foundation, not just for a career in HR, but also I had the opportunity to also get a good amount of global experience uh, across the globe. I also got some cross-functional experience, which I'm a huge fan of and advocate for everyone to, even if you're on one path, learn about as many other areas in the business as you can, and also as many different businesses and industries as you can. And I had that um, ability when I was early in my career. I've had specialized roles when I was at The Gap. I was a deep role in recruiting and, and um, uh uh, staffing. So I was deep in a part of HR that gave me some specialization. I then joined a company that was at a really early stage and I got some startup experience. So I've mainly worked for really big companies, but that was a very, very small company that we built from the ground up, a very different experience and great experience. At Honeywell, I also worked in Belgium. So I had four years outside the US in another country again, which was brilliant and also dealing with other facets that I wasn't familiar with, union relations in a European setting, really, really challenging and something that, that I think really grew me um, and, and I learned a ton from. In Applied Materials, a really, really global company where the majority of their revenues is from outside the US, mainly Asia. So phenomenal experience again to have such um, a rich experience from something different that builds built, built my knowledge and built my experience base. Um, at Rolls-Royce, uh, I met Frida and I lived in the UK for nearly four years, uh, a period of significant transformation. So brilliant to be able to get involved with every aspect of the business 
and also a different industry, different culture. Uh, most recently, I'm uh, currently a senior advisor in the talent and organization practice at Accenture. And I've kind of gone off and done what's called a side hustle today. And I've built my own business, just like you guys have done such brilliant work around STEM uh, with Educator Global. I mean, it's so important to have a foot in whatever you're doing and to stay connected to something bigger. So for me, I've always been incredibly passionate about human potential. And from an HR standpoint, there's a lot you learn that you consider sometimes insider secrets or insider knowledge that frankly, everyone should know about, but for a lot of reasons, we don't make it as open and transparent as it should be. So that's my business. It started out with podcasts. We've added coaching, we're adding workshops, but the whole goal is to help people not only navigate the kind of future, which is very different with careers than it used to be, but also to reach whatever goals they have. I mean, there's nothing better than that to help people reach whatever life and career goals they, they have. That's amazing. Um, you said a fun fact too, Frida? Yes. What's your fun fact? Um, That's the good. fun fact is along the way, because obviously, so I moved around a lot, saw a lot of, lot of different places and countries and experiences. Um, this is just a sampling of some really fun, cool leaders I met along the way. And it was just, you know, it was amazing for me, a great experience you'll see on the top row, um, I met Obama actually in the White House uh, as part of a team who presented to him. And then casually, I asked if he'd like to come visit our manufacturing site. Didn't think that would happen. And a month later, wow. Texas, that's Applied Materials where he came to tour uh, our site, which was phenomenal. In the middle, that's Queen Rania of Jordan, who I gave a humanitarian award to way, way back uh, at a Microsoft facility years ago. And that on the top right is Joe Biden, who I met earlier this year, uh, which is fabulous. Amazing. Uh, is uh, president, former president of Taiwan. The middle is David Cameron. And on the far right, I think, or my right, is the um, group. I, I was able to be involved with several leadership activities at uh, Buckingham Palace in the UK. and efforts around diversity and inclusion in the UK. So that's a sampling. My big takeaway from that is, even though it's cool and exciting, these leaders are human beings just like us. And when you see them in a different setting, you know, kind of the down to earth setting, you really see that they have their own challenges, their own fears, their own, you know, successes and mistakes, and they're all, we're all human beings. So phenomenal experience for me. Wow, thank you so much, Mary. That's that's amazing. Um, I'll pass over to Michelle. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. I've got my notepad and pen ready to write down all these tips. <laughs> but um, before we go on, um, just to let everyone know that this session is recorded and will be posted on a little bit later on. And also, if you have any questions, um, any burning questions, just drop them in the chat and we'll aim to answer them the session is finished. So without further ado, I'd just like to start with my first question for you, Mary. Um, so has being an effective leader always come naturally to you? I mean, you make it look so natural, but you know, or have you always had to work towards it? Always work towards it. And I think everyone will. Um, and the reason is, even if you have innate qualities, and we all do, everyone does. Now we're talking about a leader like it's a role. And it is sometimes an actual role that someone does in an organization, but we all are leaders every day, everywhere in our behavior. So that's a choice when we behave in a way that is leader-like, everyone is a leader. If it's a formal role um, and the title has some kind of leadership and it's a, a scope of responsibility that influences others, it changes and it changes a lot. And this, this chart that Michelle just threw up is one I love because it shows you that the predominant style has shifted over the years. And so when I grew up in my career, and that's 30 years ago, the predominant style was what you might know as command and control. And it worked because it fit the times we were in. But that was one that was very formal and the leader had all the answers and it was very hierarchical and everybody looked up and wanted to move up in an organization. We all know that that that's not the predominant style today and it doesn't really work. Now in times of crisis or you know, an extreme situation or in parts of the military, 
that that style does generally work, but things did over the years. So we have to shift and we have to constantly um, learn and grow and adapt our style to the times that we're in. So today we're in a digital world and God, things are changing. Forget 2020. There's so much technology change and global change and demographic change that no one, no one leader can have all the answers. So the style is one that's really empowering, really distributed leadership. And leaders are much more authentic and are coaches to their teams and their workforces so that they can harness all the potential that's there. That's the leadership style that has the most impact today and in the world as we go. Now, I will tell you as someone who grew up and learned these styles of command and control, that's radically different. So I have had to, we all have to shift and learn and grow. It's different. And, and it's important that as times change, we pivot and we adapt. The next one kind of shows, Michelle, if, if you wanted to, I think there's a big question. It's, I'll share with you in a second what I think are some of the biggest sort of leadership, uh, let's say traits, characteristics, behaviors today. But it's a question we should all ask ourselves. We all work with people, we all see them in the media, the press, some of the people we put on the last chart who, or in, 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 any, in any environment that we know, we make impressions. They have impressions on us, on us, whether we work with them closely or we just see them more at large. An important question we ask is what do we all admire? What do we think really are those behaviors and those characteristics of people that we would willingly follow, that we would wanna join their team, be on their team, give our best. Deeply, we know our answer to that. We all have a perspective and that's a really important consideration. As much as what any of us will share our own perspective, knowing what you think about that is a really important question. And also thinking of the opposite. What does it look like when you don't admire or you wouldn't wanna follow or you wouldn't wanna be anywhere near that leader? What, what is it about them that, that, that you find? Because that also informs how you wanna be. So the next one I threw together, just a couple of thoughts. It's um, just a couple of things that I think are in that last category in the world we live in today a few things that are really the way forward in terms of what's most effective for leaders. Um, hopefully these resonate with you because um, these, are, these are big deals and not easy. The first is someone who really inspires others with not just a vision, but that shared vision that really takes account of everyone's thoughts and ideas at all levels of the organization and, and really inspires people to go in a certain direction that we all wanna go in because it's that shared vision. And I worked in a lot of companies coming up through my career that thought vision were financials, you know, but I do not know of anyone that gets out of bed and says, let's go after earnings per share today or whatever, net income. That is, that's an outcome of great business, but it isn't the vision. The vision is, is a unified place that we all wanna to go to because we believe it has impact on customers, shareholders, the world. The second is that communication piece. And the two big words are that it's often in different ways, often and transparent. Because often today, as we said, in the world we live in, we don't have all the answers, who knows? You can only share what you can share at that point in time as honestly, as vulnerably as you can. And when you know more, you share it again. But we really respect leaders who aren't hiding when times are tough, but are visible and are communicating and transparent. The other is because of the dis distributed leadership, great leaders today empower. They, they, again, they really, really let the brilliance of their teams come through, but they don't walk away and say, good luck, everyone they then remove obstacles. So their job is not to have all the answers and everything rolls up and they make a big decision. They empower 
and then they support by getting all those obstacles out of the way. And the other big one, these last two are really big deals. The, the newest thing is investing in well-being. It used to be like, hey, when you're at work, be your work self, but hey, if you have mental health, physical, something else, you know, that's for you to figure out and you're here at work. Today, not so much at all. Your financial stability, your career employability, your mental health, your physical resilience, your belonging, your engagement. These are things that matter to every leader or should matter to every leader and are very much part of what differentiates great leadership and great companies. And the last is modeling the way. So if you think, and I will tell you, I can relate to this as well, where we used to in the past say, here's what we should do, but the leader never went first really, or thought that it applied to them. Not only does it apply to them, we have to model the way and we have to go first. If we're going towards a shared vision or we're saying we're gonna do something, the leader models it. Otherwise it's not credible. Uh, it doesn't work, but the leader goes first. So those are just a few of the, and I'm really passionate about these because in some ways you could look and say, oh, they look simple. No, they're incredibly hard to do. And they take a lot of self-awareness. They take a lot of need for feedback and you have to keep chipping away at them and growing in them. Hi, um, thank you so much, Mary. That was really good. Um, so we'll move over. So you've talked about the modern leadership. So when you're selecting a team, putting together a team, what do you look for? And also touching on the diversity and inclusion piece. Um, we've had a few people who may be on the call that have struggled to get into leadership positions. They've been at a company for, let's say, five to 10 years. And they think because of their unconscious biases towards diversity and inclusion, they've really struggled towards that. What advice would you give these people? Should they get themselves a sponsor? How do they get themselves in that leadership, that higher position to be able to further their career and make a greater change in the company? That's a great question. And that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> in there so let me see what I can do with it I don't have any I don't know if any of the uh the, the charts go with this in is precisely but I would say this um first of all I, I look for teams that are richly diverse in all aspects because if you do if you go and look at any research anywhere on innovation it's the richness of different backgrounds, experiences, perspectives, styles, every which way you can cut it that leads to the best innovation. Fundamentally, that's the truth. Now, easier said than done. If I'm asking that question, I want to go forward and make sure that wherever I want to work or wherever I currently work knows that richness about me. Sometimes we think we all know, but I'm talking beyond the obvious. Um, a lot of those experiences I showed you that I had, I created because they didn't exist. And I forced my way in and I pushed my way in. I've led teams where I was the youngest. I've led teams where I'm the only female or I've been on teams. <laughs> you know, I've been different my whole career. I've been in engineering environments all my life with a psychology background. Everything is possible it's your confidence, it's your ability to get back up when somebody says you can't do it. I tend to take that on as a challenge and say, watch this. Um, it's to go look for leaders who get it. Don't stay too long with leaders who don't because they do not deserve you. You go work for people who deserve your greatness every day. Sometimes you can't do that right away because of all kinds of reasons that get that, but really find those cultures, those environments, those leaders and teams that get it um, and help them appreciate all that is unique and special and wonderful about you. Don't let it be a secret. So offer to lean in on things, offer to do more than, you know, sometimes it's, it's in the crevices of activity. But again, Frida, you're a brilliant example of this ever since I've known you. You, you speak up, you show up, you you do more, way more <laughs> than you know the box. And the box is this big, but 
you know, that sometimes that's really what it takes. And again, I really get that not always is that possible. It takes a lot of life commitment and time and investment and, but different times in your career in life that will be possible and you go for it. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Michelle. Brilliant. Um, so just then off that, um, how would you keep your team members motivated as a leader? One more time, Michelle, sorry, I didn't come. Um, how would you keep your team members motivated as a leader? Ah, well, you know, there's a chart on this, Frida, with the team. I, I chose three pictures. And the, the reason I have this, and again, you can, this is my perspective. You can do a lot of different things. But I think part of it comes from really knowing your team and asking. They have way more ideas than you may ever and they have individual things that motivate them that are different by each person. And they have things that may work in common. Uh, sorry, it's a picture page, uh, Frida. It's got kind of uh, photographs rather. Um, oh, sorry, no, go back. Do you know what I'll do? No, you are right. Uh, you are right. Let's, let's go to the one you were just on. Yeah, sure. I'll make a couple points in here. It's a great page to, to make a couple points. I think, if you go to the right, the purple one, the purpose and belonging, we chatted about that, but you're motivated when you really believe in what you're doing. Something we've all had jobs where it's just a job, but when you really believe in what's happening, that purpose, but you believe in it, it's not just the company's purpose, you align to it, you're really motivated. But you have to feel like you belong very much to the question you asked. Um, I met Frida shortly after I saw one of my very favorite movies of all time called Hidden Figures. Yeah, hopefully you guys know what movie it's like five years ago, whatever. But it really exposed me to um, a person, a leader who was not known for the brilliance that they contributed. And this woman's name is Katherine Johnson who worked at NASA in the US back in the sixties who was part of a team. She was a mathematician who was part of a team that helped with the launch and landing codes uh, to be able to, <laughs> to put a man on the moon, a person on the moon, and, and yet wasn't seen. She was leveraged for her work. So she was part of purpose. Can you imagine at that time, how, the purpose and how big that was, but she didn't belong. She wasn't made to feel like she belonged. That's a crime. Imagine what NASA and the world could have could have seen if she really belonged and felt like she belonged. So to me, I think that's motivating. She still did brilliant work, but we'll never know what could have been because to some extent, even though she, she was probably one of the classiest people who never complained and never, you know, I mean, believe me, to the day she died, which was uh, earlier this summer, she, she, she did not make that an issue, but it was. And and a shame and a loss for the world. The other is the top left, which is career agility, which is the extent to which we feel somewhat, you know, paid well, financially secure. That's a consideration. That's that's a big deal if it's weighing on our minds. We could all make more money and we could all, but it's that burden of that, that that's a big deal. The other piece that goes with that is employability. If we motivate people when we invest in their development, not just for my job and my needs, for my team, but for whatever their career employability might be. I recently coached someone who said they wanted some advice because their leader would not let them go to a certain development opportunity because it wasn't relevant to the job they were in. And that's just crazy because think of the motivation of that person who is afforded the opportunity to go develop for the future, the benefit is how they then come back and, and appreciate and show up more because of that investment in them. Even if the skill is you know, something else. The last is just resilience. We talked about that, but if you feel motivated because the leader really cares about you, your own, again, physical and mental resilience, which is really important, those are big deals. The next page I'll just flash because this is a personal, motivating is a big, a big thing, a big word here for this page, but I learned this and late, I would say, because it's, I grew up where 
you know, giving constructive criticism kind of was a common thing. And I never necessarily thought of it as a bad thing because I always thought that's what helps us make ourselves better. But there is this, this is Kuz's, I think the uh, bottom got cut off from the attribution, but this is a magic ratio of generally speaking, think about it for every one critical development offering you give someone, hey, Frida, Michelle, you could be better at X. How many positives do you think one would want to do as a leader first? You could have an infinite number, but the general rule is three to one. And the three is there because, and I have used this. So when I learned about this, I thought, you know what, let me try it. I was about to give a performance review to someone I'd known for years. He'd worked for me multiple times. And I saw that when I gave him, you know, constructive development feedback, he kind of wilted almost like a flower and he kind of went away and he went, and I thought, oh, that's not working. And when I gave this particular feedback, very real feedback, I said, his name, you were great at this. This went really well and wow on this and what an impact an opportunity is, boom, showed up completely different. Now, again, this may seem simplistic, but I tell you it's massively powerful because we can all as human beings hear it differently. We feel secure in the three. It takes those three to really feel confident, good about yourself, generally you know, secure to hear that one or two other opportunities. So I would encourage you all to practice this, watch for it. It's really powerful. Actually, it works, I guess, in any relationship between two people, but in a coaching leadership relationship, there's nothing more motivating than being sure we pay attention, a lot of attention to what's going right and telling people as often as possible at a higher volume than we're giving the feedback on the opportunity. Perfect. Thank you. So that's um, a little tip on how people can offer great constructive feedback. So when we're looking at, um, so could you give us examples of where team building activities that leaders could organize these activities to bring their teams closer to each other um, in order for pr productivities to increase and successful collaboration? What can they do? Sure. sure. That's the picture page. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about it. So these are three examples. Um, the first one on the right is just fun. It's just have, you know, is the go out and let your hair down, no, no agenda, more the pure fun and relaxation. This was an example of um, one year, uh, that's my larger team, might be a couple levels, it's the larger team. Um, we all budgets were cut and there were no holiday parties. Nobody could spend any money and all holiday parties were canceled. My team had done tremendous things. And I thought, nope, I'm having the party and I'm having it at my house. And then every team member said, well, you shouldn't take the whole burden. We're gonna bring something. So people brought things. We did a gift exchange. We played games. We, this was like a seven hour, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it was a big, big deal. By the next year, when we could have, you know, company sponsors parties again, nope, everyone came to Mary's house and we did these parties for probably four or five years while I was there because we just enjoyed that pure fun bonding together as a team, but everybody played a role. It was our created fun. That's always good in whatever way and format. Everyone, there's a million ideas. People have done cooking together. They've done whatever it is. It's, a, it's an activity though for pure fun and everybody contributes. The bottom left is another one where we work together as a team to give back to something larger than ourselves. And what a bonding experience that is, again, whether it's related to STEM, this was a community effort. Um, for uh, helping a food bank in our community to really, really, um, uh, they had just an explosive year of need for us. We worked together on it, but again, those are just, they're bonding in a different way. And the top right is when it's around the work where there's a problem that you have to solve together, but it doesn't feel like work. It feels like that, that fun teaming where you're getting together, maybe you make it fun around there, 
but that you're problem solving as a team. And maybe you are, you know, again, pairing people and doing it in a way that, that makes it interesting, creative and fun, but it's really around the work. So it's gotta be a balance. Sometimes think people think team building is all that right-hand side. Let's just all go out and have a great time. But no, there's many, many ways to do it. Um, but around the work and, and thinking about using all three is really helpful. All right, thank you so much. These are fun pictures as well. Um, so we'll move over to Michelle, over to you. Yeah, um, so my next question. So obviously being a leader, um, it does come with this difficulty sometimes, and that could be in the form of a difficult team member, or maybe you might have clashing personalities with someone. But as a leader, you're expected to kind of um, be the bigger person per se, but sometimes it's much easier said than done. Um, so what advice would you offer an individual that is managing a team with said difficult um, team members within this team? It's a really great question. It's a tough one to answer because sometimes the there's specifics behind it that really matter. Mm -hmm. um, as a general answer, I have found to not let that go too long, to have a real sit down heart to heart with the person. Sometimes it is harder today, of course, outside the office, but in a setting where you kind of remove the work bit and it's a more personal setting, but finding whatever way that works to, to have what's really a heart to heart and just say, hey, you know, I notice this, um, it, it's having an impact. And, then, and, and you may show the caring about them, that it's not serving them or it's hurting them in some way too. What is it? What's going on with them? What's happening? What can you do to peel it back with them a little bit Sometimes just that deep conversation will help. Sometimes it's more than that, but it's the best place to start is to, to seek to understand and to peel it back a bit and not assume, because sometimes we assume a lot of things, um, but to really just go and kind of check it out with the person and to make it as personal a connection as possible. So not like, leader and subordinate in your office or something like that, but something without all of that in the background. I totally agree. I mean, when I think of some of my best managers, I think more of the personal relationship I had with them they didn't just see me as an employee, they saw me as an individual. So for example, if I came into work, I don't know, 20 minutes late, they'd be thinking, oh, did Michelle not catch the bus today? It's not something that they needed to know, but it kind of showed that they looked at me as more as to somebody that's there for full productivity per se. And it helped me work better as well. So definitely, because exactly. you always remember how someone makes you feel at the end of the day, after yeah. you've left the job or you've moved on, the people that exactly. stay with you, that, you know, they're really connected with it. So that's, that's a really good answer. Exactly, and Michelle, you're making me think, so let's say then whatever that issue is, they start to get a bit better. I would force that too and thank them and say, I thought that meeting went really well. And I really appreciated that you, um, you know, whatever they did that is now starting to be more constructive on the team or more helpful and really reinforcing that sometimes they need the attention of the leader, but there could be all kinds of things going on for them. Definitely, definitely. Home life plays a massive part in work life, so 100%. Um, so I'll just move on to Frida, who's got the next question. Okay, thank you. So reflecting on your experience of a good leader, how involved do you need to get? So for example, micromanagement, or do you delegate? What's the best, what's the best um, quality in a leader and how, yeah, so how involved do they need to get? Because there's some managers that really want to know everything you're doing, and they don't delegate and empower you. So what's the fine balance from your experience? Well, um, we chatted about it a little bit before. I think empowering to the extent that you can is always the best rule for today, largely speaking, and really pushing the work to the people who should be making the decisions and should be, you know, um, uh, in the meetings and leading for it. I'll give you an example, by the way, the meeting I mentioned with Obama. Yeah. My CEO was supposed to go to that. I didn't get the invitation. He got the invitation with other CEOs and he couldn't go. And he looked around as a leader on his team and he chose me to go. That's brilliant. Amazing. He didn't have another thought. That is what we ought to do is to really, really give people those, not just the work, 
but those opportunities to present, to show up, to shine, to, to be involved in things, even when sometimes we'd like to be doing them. And I think on this one, my rule of thumb might be it's a bell-shaped curve, meaning you want to empower the best you can. And there are times that too much empowerment, you know, when it's not needed, might not be good, but you also don't want to hold it up. I think if a leader is sitting on someone too much, it, it can be about them, but it can also be about you. So I say, ask the leader, you know, um, is there something they need to see more regularly? I would check in on the trust level. Was something late? Was there, is there a reason behind it? Or is it really about them and they, um, maybe they'd reflect on, they had a bad experience where they didn't check on something and then it was presented and it was wrong and they overplayed that in their mind. There's some reason behind that, but really err on empowering. All right, thank you. Awesome, brilliant. Um, so for your next question, um, reflecting on your experience of a good leader. Oh, sorry, um, just one second. Sorry about that. Um, how do you focus on your individual development while pushing other people towards their own development? I can imagine it's a bit of a balancing act and it can seem a lot. So how would you say would be the best ways to balance both of them? I mean, you run the Modern Cure podcast and on top of that, you still have the corporate side of you. I love this question because I, you asked Joe, were you a natural leader? I don't know. I've been a natural learner. I think that must be highly correlated with something in life, success or leadership, or, but we're, we're all on a journey through life and we're hopefully continuously learning. I think it might have been Jack Welch who said this, but the only competitive advantage of a country, a company, a person is their ability to continuously learn. Yes, it's very Darwinian. It's that's all we've got is our ability to learn. So I, and I grew up with a lot of people around me who are educators, so maybe it comes from that, but I learn and I absorb it like a sponge. I try to ask myself, and by the way, with leadership, we're never there. You're never like, oh, I'm there and I'm perfect and I got it all together and I don't make mistakes. Far from it. I make mistakes all the time. And I, I think it's trying to be self-aware be open to feedback all the time, even the uncomfortable feedback and being a bit vulnerable that you're constantly, even if you are pretty good at something, we slip. So it's reflecting on the, you know what? I can coach someone better than I have been. Or I, I find that I didn't really listen well. So I probably, I can listen better. I can be more positive to someone. I can say thank you more, whatever it is. It's, it's having those thoughts in your mind but holding them lightly because we're all human beings and we're all on a journey of learning. It's not to crush you or feel bad about it. It's to constantly go, Ooh, next opportunity. I'm going to do that better. That's a really good point you've made that Mary. And it actually stems into some of the questions we've gotten in our Q and A, but I'll get right into that in just a minute. Um, that is actually all our questions for today. Um, thank you so much for answering them in such detail, Mary, honestly. There's been quite a lot of scum of questions going off them as well. Well, in the last, just that last, yes. if you flash it, Michelle, yes. there's a point here and then I'd love to go to any questions is just, it goes with it, which is, so where do I start? And I think it is, not make it so big. It's, it's learning and so just asking ourselves, how can I be a better leader? How can I be a better leader? And it's a daily or weekly or whatever, you're just reflecting and doing and keep it small and make small improvements. I believe that that's the best, the best way forward. Um, and Mary, just before we conclude, I wanted to touch point on um, the importance of mentoring and having a sponsor in your career journey. It's huge. It's huge. Um, you know, and I think these can take all forms. I'm not, you know, I, I don't want you to think you have to have it all formal and, you know, whatever. I mean, again, Frida, if you don't mind me using this example, when we met, um, you came right up to correct me on something I said that I used an example of something and lo and behold, we were doing it right in Rolls Royce and <laughs> who knew, but who is going to tell you if people don't come up and say, do you know what, that, you know, this was a big deal. 
uh, that there were, you know, so that was beautiful. And then I think after that, uh, shortly after that, you asked if, if, um, if uh, I could be a mentor. Now, again, that's brilliant. Uh, but I believe at the time, you'll have to correct me, you were you're still so young, but you were like 21, something, yeah, I think you know, pretty well. right, up, right? Yeah. said, yeah. Mary, I'd like you to be my mentor. And then in, within an org, I mean, that that can be intimidating for some people. I go right up to the executive staff and I, it was brilliant. And I made a deal with you and I said, sure, I love it, but I want you as a reverse mentoring relationship. Yeah. So um, I believe that's really powerful. I think... Um, you know, again, I learned that way back in the day from Jack Welch, who way back, you know, whatever, in his time, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when the whole digital thing was infant and starting, he realized, oh my God, we have all these assistants and whatever doing it. I don't know how to do anything. So he got a really young, new, early career employee to mentor him and coach him on IT and on digital and how to, you know, stay current in that, which is brilliant. And he talked about it all the time about how much we can learn. And <clears throat> so that's the beauty of it is when there's, you know, co-elevation is what it's called now and co-learning between uh, everybody. So I would reach out, people can say no, um, ask, um, you know, I think that's the beauty of it. Never be afraid to ask anyone if they can, give you some insights, some advice, some sponsorship, some help. If you could pick their brain, if you could take them to lunch, if you could do a Zoom call, um, a coffee with them one day. It's just, you know, again, they can say no, they can say not now, um, or they can say yes. And most often they'll say yes, or they'll help in some way. So there's beauty in that. And I think the richness is make that a really broad network people who are like you, people who are different than you, people that live in different places, think differently, look differently, have different experiences, um, study different things, you know, mix it up because the richness comes from that diversity. Yes, I agree. And I think um, if possible, just an advice is maybe get a mentor who's a part of your, you know, career in, for example, for me, I've got a mentor in Rolls Royce. So Mary was my ex mentor before I got the next one and get somebody maybe externally. So if you're planning to develop a side hustle, maybe get somebody who's already gone before you and done that for themselves. And you can be asking them questions. So you don't need to be limited to just one mentor. You can have multiple mentors, but just make sure that you're accountable in that relationship. Because again, they're the, you'll be the one driving that relationship. So that is very, very key. Not just a one-off conversation and that's it. Continue that relationship and bond between your mentor. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that, Mary. Um, and I'll open up the floor for any questions now. I think we've got a few in the chat that I'll pass over to Michelle to ask the first one. Yeah, sure. Um, so the first question, yeah. How do you grow your leadership skills when you are not in the role of being a leader? Oh, that's a great one. I think you don't ever have to wait till you're in a role. Um, it's, you know, if you look at those qualities, I think some of the times and something that helped me a lot in my career is that you can show up as a leader all the time. You can, um, you know, let's say it's in a meeting, you can offer to facilitate, you can communicate, you can present, you can um, develop yourself formally and informally in whatever way. But I think you never have to wait. You just, you can, you can shadow leaders. You can either watch them and, you know, sort of say, I liked this, I didn't like that. You can formally shadow them, say, wonder if I could join uh, some meetings that you go to and watch how you do things or some projects you're working on. There's so many ways, but find what it is that you might want to. So for somebody, it could be that they want to get better at some aspect of leading. So you might focus on that in particular, but, uh, but there's so many creative ways. Definitely. And I'd also like to add, I think consistency plays a big part of it as well you keep being good at something, you improve, you improve, people will start to notice, you know, you will start to shine. So it's also to have that confidence that people may not see these leadership skills yet, but if you keep at it, 
keep being consistent, keeping that person who, when they say, they also deliver at the same time. You know, you will get there because it is, is a long journey, I'd say. I don't think you yeah. ever finish the journey, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> this, um, this beauty, again, not everyone has time for it or can do it, but when you can also practice things in smaller organizations or volunteer work or somewhere where you feel maybe it's even safer um, and you can practice those skills, you can volunteer and get involved, and that's where you're really building those valuable skills. And by the way, and that comes on your CV as well and shows all the different things you've been a part of and led. Um, I'll just pass over to Ebenezer. So I think you've got your hand up. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself to ask the question. <clears throat> okay. Ebenezer, you're on mute. Thank you. He said the host wasn't allowing participants on mute, but thank you. Hi, Mary. Hi um, there. We were at Rose Rest together. Uh, I was at Bot Gate for about a year, so we would pass each other on the um, in the corridor. I think it's I was like one of two, one of two sort of. Hey, there was me, there was Christina Brooks and Bobby Jan again. So one of three black people in the on the floor play of like sort of a hundred people. And my question is. I'm a learner. I came through the operations management leadership scheme, uh, always targeting uh, leadership roles, you know, all the things you've talked about, it's the right answers and it's the things I've been learning and it's the things I've been preparing to sort of implement. And we're all leaders and I'm sure you do it when you haven't got direct reports. But also you look forward to the day where you get the reports to implement these steps and grow and, and be impactful. But it's just so hard to come by. Um, with sort of 10 years work experience, I look at the cohort I joined with in 2012 and the colleagues I see in positions with Ed Hov in their title, position with sort of um, senior leader, whatever, in title are my white counterparts. Um, my sort of ethnic minority counterparts are in perhaps individual contributor roles. And it's just very, very, very disheartening. And then you got some leaders at the top, you know, you had Luke Logan. And again, he was one of very, very few. And it's just getting that trust, getting that opportunity to enact this leadership passion, you know, that the learning is there just need the opportunity to get in the seat. Well, first of all, fabulous. <laughs> it's fabulous to see you. Um, I, it's a great question and it's a very, very open and, and vulnerable question. I love that. And I think, so here's the thing. I, I can't remember if Luke moved on or if Luke is still there, but I, I think maybe you have him as a potential mentor. You might even want to formalize that. But I'd also have someone else, someone who, again, you think is in a role or is on that path that you want to go to. And I would ask them very formally to mentor you, if not sponsor you. Um, and you may have done this, but I would have a really big heart to heart with your manager and maybe a few others on this very question. This is what I aspire to do. This is what I really would love. How do I do it? What are the, you know, what are the steps? What are the roles? What is the learning? What do I do need to do more of, less of? Um, which opportunities do I need to get involved with or could I get involved with that will help me accelerate? So to your point, you feel like you wanna, you know, you wanna get a, a jump up, an accelerator, not just and and that's the key is, is getting that knowledge and information. But by doing that, you're getting their support, you're getting their awareness. So when they're sitting in meetings where there's talent reviews or discussions about opportunities, the more they know about you, what you aspire to do and your willingness, they're going to think of you. That's true for everybody, by the way, is I've said in many a talent reviews where we'll talk about, let's say, 
I'm picking on you, Frida. We're talking about something and I say, Frida's great and everyone should know Frida. And the room goes, I, I don't know Frida. I've never heard of her, never seen her. We don't know her. That's not what you want. You want everyone in the room to go, oh, I know who you mean. And she's fabulous and this and that and the other. So part of that is our own visibility, getting involved in things that you think, oh, this is going to take a little work, but I'll get to see everyone and they'll get to see me and what I'm really good at. Part of it is our brand. I hate to use that word, but it is an important word that we shape what people think about us. It's the words we use about us. So if you wanna be a leader, you're constantly talking, you know, constantly, <laughs> you're talking about your leadership contributions, you're letting it be known, you're using every vehicle to shape their impression of you and that brand. So I hope that helps a little. Um, you're fabulous to so just keep, you know, sometimes things feel stuck and then boom, they open up. Sometimes it takes, you know, I call it the, try the front door, the side door, the roof, the attic, you know, you come at it as many ways as possible because it's never just the front door, you know? Thank you so much for that answer, Mary. I think that relates to quite a lot of people that feel like their career's on a bit of a, kind of like a hold still. So thank you for that advice. Um, so my next question now is, how do you think that leadership has changed in this new virtual environment? It seems as if this is gonna be a massive adaptation that we all need to kind of adjust ourselves to. And it's affected, you know, the way we work, et cetera. So for example, um, the work from home environment, how could a leader be able to successfully, successfully build new relationships? Um, you won't have that face-to-face -face, um, interaction as much anymore. Everything's, as I said, online. So how would you navigate this new situation? Yeah. It's brilliant. I think the fundamentals still apply. Um, we have to be really thoughtful and respectful of these global teams that are all over the place and the different time zones and the different challenges that that presents. And look, we all know it's gonna be a while. There, I mean, as hopeful as we are today with vaccines on the way and things changing, things it's going to be a while and some, some things will stay very virtual. I think the same things would apply is, is checking in with people, being conscious of your own days that you're not feeling good or feeling, you know, like you, uh, and also the informal ways that you can be personal, you know, maybe the coffee chat with someone rather than it feel like a meeting and just having it be more of a, you know, those informal check-ins and being sure that you are checking in with people and feeling like they can, um, you know, be a hundred percent when they're a hundred percent. And maybe um, we all have days where this is heavy and, and, or you've got lots of life things going on around you and, um, you know, that's the main thing in showing your care um, and support. Yeah, definitely. Keeping, as you said before, that kind of emotional side of things that, you know, you're a person, I'm a person, it's a difficult time. Let's not forget that. So definitely. Um, and it may be, it may be, Michelle, that I don't know, because different environments, this may not apply. But, you know, let's separate what I would call the wheat from the chaff. You know, the saying is focus is important. We've all got to do the main thing, but this is not a time for, you know, frivolous side projects and all the fluff that sometimes gets involved in, in our work. This is, let's all just do the, the core of what has to be done and, and let some of the rest of it go. It's, it's critical prioritization at its best. And I will tell you again, full full candor. I was, <laughs> I'm an expander. So I was never great at that in my career. My teams would get bogged down and we'd have to say, no, come back to that core. So really paying attention to, you know, the critical few things that must happen, but not everything. Right. Um, I've got a question. So here Narmeen's posted to us is, how do you build a, a relationship with a new leader after a restructure? So this is definitely relevant, especially with the COVID, the pandemic, everything that's happening, a lot of companies are restructuring. So let's say you already had a relationship with a leader in terms of mentorship, they knew your goals, your aspirations, and then suddenly they leave the company and you have to start that again. So does that push you back in your career or does how, how do you adjust to that? What would you advise to Narmeen? Mm. This is a good one. So I'm going to tell a story. You just remind me of someone that worked for me that did this really well. And 
so there's a, a, you know, this is another bell-shaped curve, but I would reach out and I would say, if they haven't already inst instituted this, I would like a regular touch base with the person. And the reason is you want to keep them really in touch with what is happening in your space that's really critical. So maybe that's weekly 30 minutes, maybe it's every two, whatever it is, don't ask for more time than you need. Be really respectful of that because you don't want it to be a negative. That's the bell shape. But you want to come with an agenda and you want to inform them, here's what's happening and it's all on track and it's all good. Here's some support I could need from you. Here's what you need to know to be prepared to go into anything they need to. I had someone who worked with me early in my career who I managed who came in that way every meeting. It was so impressive and so effective. And my view of them went from here to here. And it was their agenda. So, you know, it's not the manager's full agenda, it's your agenda. You come and you, again, be really respectful. It's that powerful, even it's 15 minutes. It kind of goes a little bit to Ebenezer's question. It's, it's that branding and showing up. We tend to think everyone knows what we're working on or knows us. Maybe you start to share something broader, you know, as, as the relationship grows or you ask them about them. You're now proactively managing that relationship with this new leader. And I think it's key, it's about branding yourself and letting them know exactly what you're involved in. Because a lot of us are maybe shy. We don't like to, um, you know, spread the good news about what we've done. But sometimes you need to do that in order to gain the visibility. Think of how many people are in that company wanting the same positions as you. So, yeah, um, I'll pass over to Michelle for the final question and then we'll wrap up. So we may be two or three minutes late. Apologies for this. But great conversations. So, um, so you said before that there were some insider secrets um, that you received working from HR that people don't know about. And so people are asking, what are these secrets? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, I can't tell you. <laughs> um, well, there are many because just like there are in any function, it's the knowledge within that area. You know to manage things, but you, you know, um, so part of them are, you know, again, it's a longer conversation. I would steer everyone to go to moderncareer.com, um, you know, it's modern-career.com because every one of our episodes, all of our career stories, all of that shares, it's built on being more open and transparent about all of these. Some of them come from the talent processes. They're, how do we make decisions around who we hire? How do we onboard someone really well? How do you get it, you know, how does someone get in a promotion or advance in their career? Um, you know, how do you grow and prepare yourself to pivot so that you, you know, to the best way possible, you don't get affected by a restructuring or a downsizing? You know, there are things along that. So there are tips um, and techniques that one can have, I would call it to sort of future proof your career and to advance and to reach your goals. I've just posted the moderncareers.com website for everybody to tune in if they want more details. And she has fantastic podcasts to listen to. So just follow that journey and feel free to reach out to Mary, I guess, on LinkedIn or Modern Careers um, if you need any more help on that. So, yeah, I guess I'll pass over to Michelle. We'll wrap up. Yeah, Did definitely. Did Paul ask a quick one? He's got his hand up. I yeah, I just saw that as well. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I think you're on mute. I'll just ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, I am. How are you, everyone? Hi, Paul. Good. Yes, my, my name is Paul. Um, my question to Mary, um, you mentioned that you worked at Rolls-Royce. Um, personally, there's, a, there's a position I'm trying to apply there, and I'd like to request for five minutes of your time after this session, if I can discuss it with you. <laughs> I'm just requesting. It's good, you've see, reached out. But see, isn't that a brilliant example? I mean, I can say, no, Paul, I can. I've got another meeting, just kidding. But that's really, thank you for doing that. I will absolutely stay on or we'll pop to a different meeting. But that's kind of, you know, again, that's how Frida and I got connected. And I'm not saying, you know, it's just that behavior of, of being confident and reaching out and, you know, uh, letting go of people, People don't take you on it the first time or 
they may later, or they say, no, that's okay. But really, really doing that is, is giving yourself an advantage. So thanks for showing that, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think we've got Narmeen, the last one, and then we'll round up. Yep, asked to unmute. If you just unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Hi, Mary. Firstly, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation. It's very insightful and some of the things you said really hit home. Um, but I think for my journey as well, I've been about eight years in engineering and I've come up against some like challenges and particularly around, I guess, HR and line management things where I've tried to take on board the learning and then move ahead. But again, I feel like there are some I don't know, HR obstacles, which are difficult to understand. And I'd like to find out how I can understand them better in order to work more productively. Oh, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> big one. I think, you know, again, sometimes the beauty is in the detail of someone's specific situation. Um, so that may take, you know, a longer conversation. I would say this. I would never hesitate to go ask someone in HR or a leader you really respect and ask them in your own organization that question. Just say, here's how I'm feeling. Can you help me understand this better or navigate this better? What would you do? How would you go about it if you were feeling like me? Um, what is it I'm missing or what, you know what I mean? Just sort of really yeah. put it on the table with them. I have to say, I have tried that. And the response has been, you need more time. That's just how it is. You could go mm -hmm. to union, but it won't help. And it's sort of not been very satisfactory. Mm. But I don't expect a detailed if, answer. No, no. I think if that's one person or one group or narrowly, that's the message, I'd try others. If you ask two or three and it's a broad message, my own feeling is that would not be necessarily the company you want to be at, perhaps. So I think I think never take one leader or one HR or one message. Look for others and see if you find support somewhere else in that organization and really try to broaden that um, support and that that clarity and see, see if that does change change the context. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, over to you, Michelle. So thank you so much for all of the advice, Mary. Honestly, it's been really insightful. I mean, the errors that kind of touched home to me was visibility, which is a big thing. Um, being able to sometimes blow your own horn and just seeing how it would help you further your career because sometimes it's the person that people do know about you know those are the names that come to mind when a role pops up etc and also um, also being consistent and being a good leader is also means being a good learner I think leaders do the most learning in my honest opinion because <laughs> you're faced with so many different people in so many different situations before you know it I'm pretty sure you can attest to this Mary but who you were at the start of your career is definitely a completely different woman to who you've become after you know all those years of experience so absolutely mold you and change over time so thank you for reflecting on that with us today and make sure to check out her website guys it's been dropped in the zoom group chat um, where mary covers way more podcasts and way more detail than today well so and thank you i just want to thank you it's so good to see you frida and ebony all the others that you know some i may have met before but it's wonderful thank you michelle for moderating and um, for making this so fun and easy and all the questions. I, again, I learned a lot because I get to learn what's on people's minds and what are the, you know, the, the things that are going well and the areas that still need a lot of work and need some, some support and help. So thank you for that. It was great for me and it was a lot of fun. Thank, thank you. Um, so just to give everyone a heads up, our next session is on Monday, the 30th of November, where we start to reach kind of the end of this whole process. So this topic will be on knowing your pensions and also retirement. So make sure you sign up to that um, with the links that we will be advertising. And just to wrap up again, Mary, thank you, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great. Um, yeah.
So I guess we're about to conclude the session. Thank you guys and apologies is seven minutes late. Um, so feel free for anybody that wants to maybe talk to Mary for five minutes after the session. Um, I know Paul, you've got, a, you've got a question. Feel free to start exiting if you're done with the conversation. Um, other than that, we'll just wait a few minutes. Yeah, see ya Ebenezer. <laughs> so yeah. Mm -hmm.